sector is good at doing so the flexi mou provides for example we have done it with some very good e-commerce companies uh, they wanted to train something like um, 400000 people over the next 3 years and we said we'll be very happy to do it they said we'll give our course so we'll have our ipr and we have given them the permission to maintain their ipr so they will be so we will we will be using our infrastructure and they will be imparting uh, through our um, uh, through our uh, vtps uh, through our service providers they will be providing training to their people that they will need so we have multiple models it's a completely flexible so we are working with uh, with uh, labor net uh, which will go for supervised retraining programs and we are looking we are all the time we are uh, we are um, uh, you know we are trying to involve more and more partners in this whole process we are now looking again coming back to mobility uh, you know our uh, our curricula are very watertight they don't provide flexibility so if you are coming up with a uh, Uh, with a plumber the plumber in a particular particular thing would be the one that you'll be training not a plumber who has a foundation uh, you know basic training of plumbing uh, who understands the fundamentals of plumbing and then he is able to move laterally between sector to sector so now what we are doing is that we are will be the first uh, perhaps uh, the first board to um, to uh, have a national skill qualification framework and the nsqf goes by your level of learnings and uh, expectations etc so you know we will be having some foundation programs so we are continuously revamping our curriculum the nsqf will also provide uh, mobility across uh, borders uh, so it you know you would then have acceptance in uh, in various other countries and people could be mobile uh, i think when we are talking of jobs you know the jobs are it's not just about how it's also where and for whom and where could be anywhere in the world today which is a point which uh, i think uh, the prime minister keeps mentioning a number of times um that's one part of uh, of uh, trying to create uh, create uh, mobility now another aspect of uh, you know this 10% of technical training and only 2.5% having formal i think it hugely restricts the ability of people to move uh, jobs and what we are looking at is uh, Uh, and we have started actually work on that um, uh, uh, the prime minister inaugurated something called shrami vijayate on 16th of october and a number of initiatives were launched um, uh, we have the flyers maybe the flyers can be circulated um, we launched something called recognition of prior learning you know construction with with uh, this whole thing about uh, about clean india by 2019 and uh, house for all by 2022 you'll have a huge number of people coming into construction sector uh, now you don't want them to be coming coming at the low end you want greater mobility 10.5% of our total workforce of uh, 480 million is in the construction sector so it's an extremely important sector so 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 what we are doing is we are we are working on recognition of prior learning certificates to be given so that people can be mobile now we don't want to bring down uh, our uh, assessment or, uh, or or the quality that we are talking about so what we do is that we give them a last uh, last uh, sort of we give them a g standard gap module which has been worked out with the industry a regular plumber who is only who only has prior learning what it is that is needed to be added to his knowledge so that then he can um clear uh, recognition of prior learning certificate exam so that we are doing in large numbers we are going for construction technology um you know we are also very aware that uh, where is 71% of of uh, of the potential workforce resides in rural areas you only have 49% of the jobs uh, in agriculture and related areas Uh, so there's clearly a mismatch there when you talked of mismatch and this is one of the very glaring mismatches and um, you know with with digital india with uh, with the house for all i think there is there's a great amount of jobs which are going to be created in the rural areas and we have to be prepared you know uh, Uh, the, the, the proverbial question whether you take a person to the job or you take a job to a person i think you need to have both you know it cannot be either or situation in a, in a com country as complex and as huge uh, uh, as as india uh, what we are also looking at is introducing last mile employability i in fact uh, as i say these int these modules are being introduced already a last mile employability module we believe that a lot of people in a, in rural areas um, 
they may be very good at the job but their articulation skills are not as good they can't face uh, a typical uh, you know a typical interview which i and you are used to taking and we may not be able to recognize the potential uh, in the in the people and it's only a question of polishing uh, that uncut uh, diamond you know to say um, uh, because a lot of people believe and uh, i mean this has been my personal experience that a number of times we are not able to see through the maze of uh, of uh, of their insecurity as to what lies inside and so what we are introducing is these last mile employability programs there will be soft skills there will be skills to be able to face an interview etc etc um, uh, manish had made a mention about career counseling we are moving to career counseling uh, the employment exchanges um, uh, will be replaced by career counseling uh, career um, career centers we call them and there will be a national career portal through which we will be providing various uh, aptitude tests and various other support mechanism uh, at in exchange for industry to log in um, uh, because you know like like manish said so many people there are so many people who are willing to willing to come uh, for on the employee side and there are so many people who are looking for the right person so clearly there is a mass mismatch and it's it's for all of us collectively to be able to uh, bridge that uh, mismatch and what we are doing is the mismatch could also be in terms of information asymmetry that the information is not reaching the right kind employment exchanges very interestingly are local employment exchanges so if you are based in one area you will only get access to the people in that area now that's uh, in today's day and age that's an absurd notion so we are actually looking at uh, b beyond employment exchanges creating these nat national career centers which will be in industry which could be in uh, universities they could be anywhere so we are looking at the possibility of setting up these centers um, uh, apprentices we believe is a very potent tool to get people to become industry ready and we haven't really done anything in uh, in we just about 4 lakh apprentices uh, which is which is hardly any number uh, in this session i think 3 uh, days back or 4 days back the apprentices act amendments have been passed by the parliament they have now become law they completely unshackle uh, the apprentices act earlier we would take an tell an industry that in this process for this time you can engage so many apprentices now it completely unshackles that uh, th those constraints on the industry it opens up it gives flexibility to you know we we ha the indian business has to be globally com competitive to be able to do make in india or to be able to export jobs of anything and um, uh, i think unshackling uh, apprentice act is the first major thing we have also uh, amended another um, another act that's more for the micro small medium enterprises uh, simplification of processes but more importantly what we have done and that's something that i would like to share because martin mentioned couple of things and i would like to come back on uh, 44 central labor laws 44 plus you have a myriad of state laws you know how does anybody cope with the different different uh, definitions different thresholds of uh, of employees etc now what we have done to begin with we have done two things one is a governance reform because many a time a governance reform uh, though more uh, more difficult to implement is more potent sometimes very potent what we have done is that there are 16 labor laws which are in the domain of the central government and we have four organizations through which we enforce it we have a central uh, labor commissioner we have director general mine safety we have um, uh, employees provident fund organization and we have esic which is all in the organized sector now what we are looking at what what we have done is that every every single enterprise is given a single labor identification number and they will have to file a single annual return so across the 16 laws that we have taken up to begin with uh, there would be a single four page return to be filed annually so we have we have we have it's much easier sometimes to to uh, amend your rules so we have amended all our rules and now only a four page statement would have to be filed by them more importantly what we have done is that uh, and there would be self certification more importantly what we have done is that uh, you know so we have given about 700000 enterprises have been given labor identification number which were with us across these four organizations so we we centralize the data we didn't have central data we centralize the data we uh, digitized it we deduplicated it and we should uh, lin lin to uh, 700000 now more interestingly what will be done is what is the transaction cost where does the transaction cost in terms of harassment come for an industry it comes in terms of arbitrary ad hoc inspections delayed inspection reports and 
and the sword of inspection is always lying on your head. What we have done is that um, the 175,000 uh, inspections that are done across these 700,000 units, now we have uh, come up with a formal inspection scheme which has been notified across these four organizations under which there would be a random pickup. Uh, there is a risk-based algorithm uh, which has been seeded and there is a random pickup of, uh, of inspections. Uh, these inspections would then have to be carried out within 72 hours and uploaded on the website within 72 hours. So that doesn't leave much scope for, uh, for uh, delay or for harassment. And also it will be visible to the industry uh, immediately, real time. So um, till now we have, uh, I think in the last uh, uh, about a month, we have picked up about 10,000 inspections have been randomly picked and also have been uploaded, about 8,000 have been uploaded. Um, that's that's a governance reform. On the legislative legislative reform, um, I think it's extremely important that this is done without further delay. And what we have done is that we are looking at having five codes, five labor codes, which will subsume. Uh, so we, one will be on wages, one will be on social security, one will be on others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there will be five labor codes. Uh, which will subsume all the 44 acts uh, into one. Uh, incidentally, on the portal, the portal, it's called Shtam Suvidha portal, um, the states, because, uh, because the rest of the acts are, are, are enforced by the states, and we are looking at the states joining, and um, you mentioned, Martin, I think competition between the cities, competition between the states is, I think, something which we really need to leverage. Uh, we are doing that uh, in our ministry. Uh, this Shramev Jaitay Karikram by the Prime Minister was launched when he released these uh, LIN and uh, actually he sent out to 1800 inspectors, somebody was talking about the attitude of the inspections and um, he sent out, we, uh, you know, SMSs went out from the Prime Minister to these 1800 inspectors saying that we consider you very important in this whole change process. So the states are very keen to do it and we are very sanguine that by uh, March of 2015 we'll have at least one or two uh, if not more states, we expect half a dozen states to be joining. Now on labor regulations, labor regulations you do need to have this. We have constituted a group and I'll be very happy if any of you were to share any thoughts, it's on our website. We have constituted an interministerial group which is looking at all these suggestions. Of course, any labor, uh, labor uh, amendment and uh, ILO breathes uh, down our neck all the time. Um, uh, we already have uh, notices from them on various things that, uh, uh, that um, it will be a tripartite process, but these labor law being put together is something which we have begun. On micro, small and medium enterprises, and I, uh, you know, in a lot of discussions it clearly comes out that MSMEs are of two kinds. One is the, the ancillaries, because ancillaries are extremely important for any big industry and they are not really dwarfs, you know, they really contribute to the business. So, so for ancillaries as well as MSMEs, uh, we have already come up with a draft uh, bill uh, which is on the website. Uh, it's, it's also getting close, so we'll be very happy to have uh, your suggestions on that. Um, um, we also have, um, we also have, uh, um, uh, you know, several other initiatives in the field of uh, uh, vocational training, uh, which are coming up, and uh, we'll be very happy to work with uh, the researchers, the private industry, the NGOs, and uh, and all of you here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for giving us a dream of Make in India. And uh, because, uh, and thank uh, uh, God, or thank the government, that there are no taxes on dreaming as yet. Uh, I know that effect is that 50% of the deficit, American deficit, of $13 trillion, plus lot of change 
I'm told belongs to China, and China is our neighbor. You know. How are we going to compete China uh, in making India is the question. But my comment on Manish uh, Sabarwal, Dr. Manish Sabarwal's uh, point, please uh, be kind and add two more E's to your three E's of education, employment, and employability, and you will find that what Einstein said in the Institute of Advanced uh, Technology, Princeton, New Jersey, that answers have changed, answers will change, and those two are equality and empowerment. Thank you. Uh, please introduce yourself. I'm Tejinder Lamba from Delhi University. Yes, please. me this opportunity. <coughs> I am C. Prashad. Uh, I am C. Prashad, uh, uh, retired deputy director general of the Indian Council of Agriculture Research. And basically I have worked in the area of uh, transfer of technology. I have been deputy DG and uh, after retirement I have a small trust called Bardan through which I work in the village even today. Uh, I have studied in India, I have studied in America, I have worked in many other countries in different capacities. And therefore, I will make few remarks. Some of them may not be very pleasant here, but this is the truth. Uh, we are talking of development here. And through development, more jobs or more jobs uh, reflect on the development. And development uh, has uh, two dimensions. One is social, another is economic. And Madam Chairperson, we are working and talking all the time economic uh, terminology, economic work and progress, all in that term, rules and regulation that uh, our Secretary said, all is being talked in that direction. But the social side is so weak that our main power in this country is extremely weak. Perhaps we are called a developed country among the developing countries. I think developing countries have a similar situation. Socially, we are terribly weak. Our education is weak. Our training is weak. And therefore, our manpower is weak. And it is here that we are not cutting much ice. And somehow, as a policy, as a rule, how we could improve over this is one thing very important. Second point, madam, I have worked in the field, even I work in the village. I also come from, I am a villager, basically I come from a village. You are talking of gender here. And uh, you know the large uh, part of this country uh, lives in villages. And I work myself with gender and the program of your Ministry of Rural Development, the self-help program, which is a very sound, very beautiful program being promoted by the World Bank and so on. Now we have changed the name. Because we didn't do very well, we changed the name. Now this is very simple. Now, Madam, my, my proposition is that for improving jobs and improving our development work, our education have to do a lot good and the training is still more good. Thank development you. requires a lot of skills and we are very weak at that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Anupam? Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Anupam Khanna. I recently stepped down as Chief Economist and Head of Policy for NASCOM. Uh, I have two questions, one for Martin. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the panel to make that very important link between urbanization and jobs. I think that's very critical. But Martin, two questions on your statistics that you presented. Number one, that part about governance and uh, you know, uh, jobs, have you corrected for the fact that the state capitals and others and the industrial townships have very skewed employment structures? So you take those out, does that still hold? Secondly, the fact of the matter is, and this segues into Dr. Co uh, Ms. Kumar's uh, question, uh, presentation too, the jobs that have been created, the primary drivers in the last 10 years, I would say, have been construction, the primary drivers, and 
Secondly, in, in the urban areas, in the IT, ITES. And then they have had a lot of multiplier effects and so on, which has led to wholesale, retail trade, etc. Given those, the question is, if you, that, if you correct for that, I wonder what it tells you about the women's opportunities. For Ms. Kumar, specific question, how are the ITIs and other reforms that you are saying targeting the changing nature of job creation in India? I think that's what Manish was saying. We have a big mismatch and I can tell you from, we've been working closely with the skills councils and all that, the, that there has been a, you know, the, the whole curriculum is very problematic. Lastly, where is the evidence? We are unlay, you know, putting forward four or five major, I would say, labor-oriented reforms. There, I find very difficult to evaluate ex ante any of them because there is no evidence that what has worked and what has worked in the, uh, is likely to work in the future. If we don't have the evidence in India, there is a lot of evidence elsewhere where we can do that but I don't see any evidence-based policy formulation occurring at present in India. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Hello, I'm Kiran Modi. I'm uh, managing trustee of Udayan Care. We are running homes for orphaned and abandoned children, so institutional care. Uh, my point is, uh, you know, there in India there are so many institutions, you know, orphanages, so to say, government run as well as uh, NGO run. The issue is uh, what are we doing about these children who are being raised in these institutions because even government is not taking cognizance of the fact that most of the children who are staying in these homes are only till age of 18 and where not much skill development is possible. And after 18, even the government is not asking what happens to these children. There is no tracking, you know, in aftercare. First of all, very little aftercare services have happened. Even in Delhi, state of Delhi, you know, there is only one aftercare service by the government, which was also started much before the Juvenile Justice Act came into being. So if you look at, you know, national policy for youth, or you look at all these different policies, they are talking about, you know, skill development for youth. But what is happening to these millions of children who are coming out of orphanages every year in India, throughout India, what happens to them? They are nobody's children. Where do they go? There is no tracking. So my suggestion, you know, earlier also we had pointed this out by sending such papers to the government. There should be some tracking of such youth and they are such potential. Like, you know, Manishji was talking about, you know, training and, you know, making them job appropriate. Why can't, you know, corporates adopt these children and start training them into the kind of jobs, you know, they are offering? Thank you, Kiran. May I now turn first, uh, Gauri, to you and then Manish, then I'll turn this side. I just have a couple of questions. Uh, one was ITI, how are you making it responsive? And, and I had uh, alluded to it that... Uh, uh, we are trying to have a very, very uh, demand responsive uh, technical training and uh, uh, the chair that we have created, the mentor councils that we have created will continuously review. Um, also in moving to national skill qualification framework, uh, which I alluded to, that would actually ensure that we are, uh, uh, you know, we are benchmarked in a much more systematic manner. The other thing you mentioned, which was very interesting about evidence base, you know, very interestingly, we don't have data. How do you create evidence? And this portal that I talked about, you know, there cannot be anything, ena no enabler can be better than technology in terms of transparency, accountability, in terms of, and the portal that I was uh, referring to, uh, that we have created, actually will over a period of time lead to uh, evidence-based policy decisions being taken, you know. How do we determine what's happening? What we have also done, and I um, uh, uh, did not mention it in my opening comments, is that, you know, we have this EPFO and um, uh, Employees Provident Fund organization. It used to deal with the subscribers through the employers, not dealing directly with them. So we have something like 42 million uh, EPFO uh, subscribers, but they had, they had no access to their accounts. They had no control over their accounts. Now what we have done is we, are, we, are creating, we have created universal account numbers for them so that we created the database and we have given them universal account number so that they can move with their universal account number. In that process, what we will do is also uh, a lot of informalization reduction will happen because uh, 
the, the contract labor, the interstate migrant workers, somebody had mentioned about that, the interstate migrant workers, construction workers, contract workers, till now could not access EPFO because they didn't have a number and they used to keep moving. So they had to close one account, they had to open another account. So in this process, a lot of formalization, a lot of them will have formal social security cover which other they, otherwise they didn't have. So we believe that a lot of construction workers, we are having campaigns to enlist construction and contract workers, so that's something which will happen. Uh, on women, uh, you had mentioned, uh, y you know, we are going to, we, uh, we are working with uh, Tata uh, Sands as, uh, as our knowledge partners. There are a lot of women coming back to work. There is also, how do you, when you say that the women labor force participation is coming down, how are you measuring labor force participation? You know, these questions have been asked again and again, and we are trying to respond to some of this, not that we have the answers, but we are trying to respond to some of these. Manish? Just uh, my, my submission says that empowerment and equality are consequences of, um, they shouldn't, they're not objectives, they are consequences. So if you give, uh, a job changes a life in a way that no subsidy ever can. So if you give education, employment and employability, then empowerment and equality will be consequences of that. So, so e the three E's make the stupid debate between growth and inclusiveness stupid debate <laughs> because if you have growth and you, but you have to have an education system and an apprenticeship system and a skill system which which sort of gets rid of your opening balance so I, I don't think empowerment and equality are they are objectives but they're not uh, the what they are the, the they're not the how and and at, at this point my submission is the how I, I only wanted to sort of respond to your society questions. Um, I, I have resented, there's nothing cultural about India's poverty. Um, you know, there, there, there is not cultural, poverty has many explanations, culture is not one of them. You know, the Hindu rate of growth was a, was a thing which irritated me when I was a child, but between 1950 and India grew at, you know, whatever, 2%, and from then we've grown at 7 We didn't shoot all the Hindus. So, um, you know, I, the, the reality is that it's not cultural and so let's not take culture as given because there's a small leap between cultural and what can you do about it. So we can unpack, we don't live in an economy, we live in a society I think most of us acknowledge, but um, we must acknowledge that our plumbing is, is a problem and um, the way to fix poverty is, is at this point less about poetry and more about plumbing. Martin. Uh, thank you, just uh, quickly, uh, Anupam uh, raised uh, a couple of uh, uh, very good methodological points. Um, what I presented is work in progress, and I want to, to say a word about it, the direction in which I think we should be going. Um, but when it comes to our analysis, where you have uh, more than 600 districts, uh, taking state capitals out or industrial townships out doesn't change much because there aren't, there aren't so many. Uh, and in fact, we try different things. It's very interesting with industrial townships. There are only 18 of them, um, but half of them are also uh, municipal uh, corporations or, or councils. So we say, okay, what if we take only the nine that are purely industrial townships, and the result appeared to hold. So this idea that having someone who has the authority to connect the infrastructure and the electricity and the roads and make it work uh, makes a difference, I think will hold. The direction in which we want to push that is that we are still uh, constrained to using uh, administrative units like districts as a unit of observation. And one of the interesting things about urbanization in India and in many developing countries is that cities do not respect the boundaries. Uh, if you think of Delhi, it has grown way beyond Delhi. So there are different ways of trying to really go to a metric of cities, uh, satellite imagery on built up areas, satellite imagery on areas lit at night. Uh, density of streets and we're in the process of doing that so what we want to put in the public domain for people to, to be able to do more work along these lines is these metrics of, of cities um, on the point of construction and women opportunities is a very valid point um, but it's interesting to look at the comparison between Bangladesh and India because in Bangladesh you don't see the decline in labor force participation rates you see in India and you have this situation where men go to work in construction in the cities, women go to work in the garment industry. Those jobs may not be the best jobs in the world, but they have been transformational in the case of Bangladesh. Rajat? There were, I think uh, there were a couple of other questions. Get the yeah. Yeah. Would you like to no, say no, no, no. No, okay. Uh, before I uh, turn it back to the floor, I would just like to add a couple of questions of my own to the panel. Um, 
Yeah, Martin, you've been talking about cities, and I know that uh, it's a, a pet theme of many outsiders who come to India to say that, uh, you know, we don't have uh, mayors in charge of cities, and if you could make those entities, they could, you know, really compete with uh, empowered mayors and all. But I think while that point is well taken, I want to highlight, and I'd like your comments on that, you know, there is much more that needs to be done for better urban governance or bet better city governance than just empowering a mayor. Right now, we have a democracy, and as uh, uh, Gauri pointed out, I, I apologize. Uh, in fact, you know, it, it's true that I met you in Surat, and. I strictly said you were running Surat. I didn't say you were commissioner in Surat. And that's an example from one among five or six states where the state government has played a very strong enabling role in decentralizing, in devolving. And we have so much work to do at that uh, uh, level unless we do that. I mean, I can tell you there are six states that come to mind when you know where you could even talk of empowering cities and mayors could make a difference and these are maharashtra gujarat tamil nadu andhra pradesh karnataka and maybe one or two others that's it for the rest you don't really even have a city in fact the uh, uh, tamil nadu i should have said the municipal commissioner of chennai uh, uh, vikram kapoor told me it, if you don't give me law and order, if you actually don't empower me to raise my own resources, what good is it going to be? In fact, they have a directly elected mayor, but that cannot be empowered. So I'm just trying to say the diversity and complexity of governance in our federal uh, structure has so much fixing, you know, with, uh, 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 it requires so much fixing that it's not as simple as making cities competitive. Another point that I would like your comment on, because you know, I look at these things from urbanization perspective. So it's important to get perspectives from different people on the panel. Much of what we have talked about really is in the realm of the state government. The government of India can only facilitate uh, it can provide guidelines, even those guidelines are resented by the more progressive states because they feel that we can do it better and faster. So in fact, the government of India's job should be to look at best practices across the board and then propagate those and encourage states to uh, adapt and, and use these. And how can you incentivize that? That's the question that I want to pose to Secretary Labor. Uh, you know, Rajasthan has done something which is very good, you know, for employment. We all hope, and we hope that other states would also do that. But what can you do to incentivize that there are more states that come up? Now, with that, I don't expect answers immediately. Let me first turn to the floor, please. We did hear today that we need to really move towards high productivity. My name is Ajay Goel. I'm from Vadvani Foundation. It's a philanthropic organization. Uh, we heard that we need to really move towards high productivity jobs, the education gaps which uh, Manish spoke about, uh, and the need for horizontalization of some of the key ministries and for employment, education, uh, and employability. There are four or five very key ministries, including yours, uh, Ministry of HRD, uh, the newly formed skills and entrepreneurship ministry, MSME, and the industry ministry. So is there anything uh, w uh, happening in terms of creating a kind of a horizontal coordination mechanism between these five, six very crucial ministries uh, uh, in this area? That's my question. Thanks. Yeah. I have worked as an economic advisor in a number of uh, ministries. Uh, my question is basically with regard to 
you know, there's been a massive growth in the number of institutions for tr providing training to, uh, you know, skills in ITIs, IITs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I believe there has been an across-the-board shortage of faculty in most academic institutions. Does it also apply to the ITIs? And if so, how is this being addressed? I am Vinod Sharma from Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research. Uh, I have state questions to Manish. And first, I would like to compliment both of you. You introduced me that she has done for. I also know that Surat uh, model and other thing, uh, Ms. Gauri Kumar. State questions, I, 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 whether I got it or not, I, I agree what you have said for that. First thing I'll say, I'll agree with that and compliment for that. One word that you say somewhere that some 60,000 people you into and you just take 5,000, so not even 10%. And then you also compare that when we compare Americans and Indians, they're not that much smarter individually. The third thing you also said that people can select cities and paint, something like that. So these two, three things just. I agree with those things, first thing is that. So I also know the answers for that, but I want to uh, hear your answers. Thank you. Uh, I, just a, a question which feeds from, I think Kiran asked a question which I, this didn't get um, kind of addressed. And then there was a question by Anupam, which also suggested um, uh, that there is not lack of sufficient data for evidence-based policy. And I think our researchers, uh, ICREER, you know, our researchers also continuously confront this problem, especially as the labor market is concerned, the quality of the data. And as most of you have said, that a lot of the action is at the state level. And then when you try and collect data at the state level, uh, you know, uh, for employment, uh, whether formal or informal, informal is, of course, much more difficult, and by enterprise, you run into a roadblock, complete roadblock. There's absolutely no data. So my question uh, to the secretary is, is there any initiative, you know, while all this labor reform, uh, uh, legislative reform is beginning to happen and there is discussion and discourse, is there any thought being provided on how to collect meaningful uh, data, uh, you know, robust data so that research institutions like us can better feed into the process of policy formulation? Maybe I can turn to you now at this stage and we'll take another round. <coughs> Some very interesting insights and queries have come in. Uh, in a federal country, ma'am, what's the role of uh, the national government and what's the role of the states? And how do they complement each other and work together? Uh, this also feeds into what Rajat said. W what do they ex in, in all our interactions, we have very regular meetings uh, on everything with the state governments. We constituted working groups with the state governments. The portal, whether it is the portal or it is the inspection scheme, we have been working very closely with the state governments to ensure that they come on board because we know our limitation that 44 acts, 16 being implemented and forced by us, the rest of them by the state governments. It just doesn't work if they don't come on board. So we have been working very closely with the state governments and let me say, ma'am, it has you know, to say that the states resent the interference of uh, the center, sometimes it's also how it is handled. And uh, in my personal experience, what they really want us to do is to provide a framework, to provide the IT architecture. They want a national IT architecture to be provided and w in which they can plug in. But the architecture has to take on board the learnings from various state governments. And that's exactly what we have been doing. Now, to respond to what you were saying, Rajat, we actually we are coming up with several portals. I only mentioned the Shram Suvidha portal, which will actually provide a lot of evidence to those who were interested. You know, we are now, everyone would have a labor identification number. Where the problem happened, it has all the ident elaborate. It's there in the flyer, you can see. What are the mandatory requirements? If there's an accident, that will become a mandatory uh, inspection. So there are lots of nuances, which I haven't uh, dwelt on. But all those will be built into it, and a lot of states are willing to keen to join us. So that's a very positive sign. So we are providing a framework. We are telling them how we did it, and you need to do in the states where similarly. So that's that's one thing that we are doing. The other thing, ma'am, uh, that uh, that that uh, I think you mentioned about uh, how do you coordinate between the various ministries? So uh, you, you had raised that issue. Now, actually, we have a very good mechanism. Uh, we have something called NSDA, uh, National Skill Development Agency. NSQF is also emerging out of NSDA. 
some ministries are a little ahead because we constituted our mentor council so we created an institutional mechanism for revamping our we trained our people how to write a curriculum we didn't know how to write a curriculum somebody raised that point you know how do you do how do you do capacity building shortage of uh, faculty how you first have to build capacities if you have not built capacities and you say i'll have a new curriculum somebody will come and write it for me no we didn't do it that way actually we, we made our people we sent them to ASCII, iaft iams to first understand how to write a curriculum so our own people were trained in how to write a curriculum and then through the distance education mode we are giving uh, we are building the capacities of our faculty who are limited it's not that we are so short on faculty we are we are short on uh, the capacities of the faculty as much as we are short on the number of faculty we are also we also have these um, uh, training institutions where we actually build faculty so we are we are actually quadrupling i mean we are increasing the capacity of the training institutions in a very large uh, number uh, they are called ATIs. So, ATIs capacity is going to be enhanced uh, very together with the distance education network that we have set up. And we have, I think by now, we have trained something like 10,000 faculty members in various uh, modules. And we have, and we, this will be a regular phenomenon that we'll be doing it through uh, satellite education. There was, uh, there was, uh, there was a, um, uh, the problem point, ma'am, that you were. Uh, we'll, we'll have Rajat. We'll have career center portal. We'll have a portal of career center. You were talking of LMIS. LMIS and Career Center Portal are very closely interlinked. What will Career Center Portal provide you information on? It will say which are, you will be able, there will be a very powerful search engine in that and this will become functional, I think by March 15 we will have this functional. People will feed their requirements in a very calibrated manner. So every industry will say which level, you know, which level requirement and we'll, we are working with the industry to be, for them to be able to feed so that they don't have to give too much information. You will have people coming in from various streams, ITIs, the results directly will come, CBSE results directly will come. And then you will be able to maybe over a period of time find out which university is most preferred in terms of, you know, today we don't have information. Now, unless, I mean, technology is the only way that you can have authentic information. So you will be able to search, okay, which university was favored by IT, ITES, which industry was favored by, by construction. Today we only have these surveys which are, uh, which are not so, uh, you know, objective or authentic or comprehensive. So I think that would be something very good. You were mentioning about urban, uh, ma'am. Uh, the urban governance certainly uh, has to be a catalyst. It has to be a catalyst. Y you know, uh, I, 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 I interacted with her when I was a development secretary and the role of the state government is going to be critical, whether it is in working with the central government or whether it is in working with the urban, uh, with, with the, with the, with the lo local, uh, local uh, bodies, whether it's uh, PRBs or it is, uh, it is uh, urban local bodies. Uh, what, what we had done in Gujarat, and this is very interesting because I was uh, industry secretary and then I moved as urban development secretary. You know, it's so interesting. You will not find any space in the urban planning for industry or business you will not find that's the last priority you will have releases coming in for residential areas in 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 pockets you know that's not how it works an urban planner takes five years to come up with an urban plan and as urban development sector urban planning sector i had both of them i realized that you cannot get the development plan to be put uh, in position or reviewed uh, with periodicity less than five years five years the world would have changed now, what was our response, policy response to that? We came up with something called a residential, um, uh, a residential township policy. It's a very interesting policy. You know, what it did was it said that we would not announce which area we are going to cover under, uh, we are going to open for residential. Uh, I talked to a lot of industries and they said we'll be very happy. You see, there's so much of uh, pollution, uh, you know, somebody talked of environment, pollution that happens because a lot of people commute it is also very dislocating uh, it's, it uh, raises social unrest you know because so many people moving to the cities to live in and then commute to the industrial areas so what we did was and the suggestions that we the, the proposals that we received there were lots of industrial uh, 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 industrial uh, corporates who were willing to have uh, uh, residential areas within the industrial complex in a manner that they were well protected in terms of environment etc so what we did was we said provided you had a certain number that you would, it'll, it need not be preceded by a development plan relaxation, you could convert it into a residential zone provided you had a critical mass and then provided you were willing to provide the infrastructure. I think and as a consequence uh, actually a lot of industries took up housing <coughs> for their workers which today they can't take up housing for the workers and if you would notice every city when it expands on the, uh, on the periphery of the 
of the city, there would be lots of industrial uh, uh, estates. Now, every city has to expand. The moment you expand, all these industrial estates become part of the city, and then you have all the problems of urban development. Now, you can obviate all of this by creating specific areas for industrial development, which we don't. You know, so you have to actually work on the industrial development front, you have to work on the urban <coughs> planning front. Urban planning cannot hold hostage to industrial development or residential development. And I think this, uh, this policy, so, you know, similarly we gave uh, the slum development, so they have, they have to be enabling policy uh, frameworks to be provided. Uh, because every urban local body cannot possibly develop its own framework. It's, it's much too uh, difficult to make. Um, I, I'd like to respond to your question about, you know, I, c nobody is disagreeing that elected mayors versus empowered mayors. The point is not elected mayors, the point is empowered mayors. Uh, and I would submit one of the l learnings of the last 50 years is one of the killer apps of prosperity is competition, and we, we can download it. Yeah. And when you shift from the technocratic approach to what to how, finally leadership matters. <laughs> you can, yeah. So if, if you uh, create leadership space for leaders, leaders will compete. Some are smart, some are stupid, some are whatever else. I, I'm just saying that an empowered mayor may be more important than deciding what the mayor will do because every mayor will decide to do things differently. So my submission, rather than decide the agenda of what we should do, let's just get leaders and set them free. That's been the, that's been the difference between great organizations all over the world. So leadership matters and please don't you know, decide what the leader has to do rather than sort of that. Second, I, I'm not sure I understood your question, Sam. I made a simple point that the opening balance of a child has a huge impact on what they can do. That doesn't mean I'm fatalistic. Carol Dweck is a psychologist at Stanford. She has two theories of the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. A fixed mindset is our capabilities are like shoe size or height, they are given. A growth mindset is, you know, they are like muscles which can be developed with working out. I truly believe that you can escape your opening balance and that that is about the three E's, the infrastructure of opportunity is what allows you to escape your opening balance. and. Um, Policy is a child of politics, <laughs> and so so this. Uh, my simple point was: I think we know what is to be done. Let's focus more on how it is to be done. And I don't think that the opening balance of a child should decide where they get to in life. If that was your question, I, I don't believe that. I, I I think that that's unfortunately true today. But I think uh, we can fix that problem. Thank you. Um, I certainly cannot claim to be an expert in, uh, on urban issues in, in South Asia, and I think, uh, Isha, you raised a very valid point. For instance, Bangladesh has elected mayors, but it's so centralized that I'm not sure that they can claim that they have a better urban performance in some way. So I, I, I think there is broad agreement in the necessity of empowerment, the importance of the state uh, in India. A lot of these issues cannot be uh, decided at a central level that will be too inefficient. So how, how urban policies handled by the states may make a difference. I uh, completely agree also with Ms. Kumar on uh, not being prescriptive. I guess there are only a few things, not the recipe of how you should do your planning, but I think there are a few things that, yes, perhaps we should keep in mind. The point of the mixity of uh, residents and economic activity as opposed to an old approach that segregates it. Uh, and I think that matters for the learning, that I think a lot when we think about uh, employability and education, we tend to think about the skills being acquired before you go to work. And one of the interesting things for countries at the stage of development of India and most of South Asia is that a lot of learning happens through jobs. That a lot of the skills, even the social skills, the reliability, the punctuality, the teamwork, are acquired through jobs. So having an environment that allows people to interact, that allows people of higher skill to interact with people of lower skill, all of that is extremely important. But then uh, I think uh, that having someone who can make the decisions, who is accountable for the decisions, having resources, I think much can be learned on the, the Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal Mission, the fact that, and I think it's something we need to explore more, what worked and what didn't work, uh, is having resources uh, but the resources have, have to come with the ability to use them and the accountability in their use. So I don't, I don't disagree, I think, with anything that uh, was said. Rajat, do you have, I, I'm just going to ask. Uh, we can yes, please, yeah, one more. 
My name is Arup Moharatna. Uh, I'm come from Pune Gokhale Institute. I was former professor there. Well, I have uh, a couple of questions for Martin Rama. Uh, let me get back to a bit of fundamental in the sense that, uh, you see, uh, when we learned economics and we were taught economics that time, and especially development economics that time, I mean, employment uh, was, was a very key word, uh, the category in the economics discourse entire. That time, uh, jobs was uh, not given much prominence in the entire literature. So people used to call employment. And as far as I understand development, the notion of development itself uh, subsumes that employment. I mean, uh, uh, jobs for employment, uh, jobs for development or employment for development uh, was a kind of oddity uh, as far as I, our learning of economics is concerned. Uh, because uh, development itself should give rise to employment and uh, then uh, people would be benefiting from that or entire society would be that. So this is, I find a bit of paradigm shift in the sense, particularly the usage of the, or coinage of the term jobs, for example. Jobs can be performed by machines. Computer can do a lot of jobs. So if you create jobs which can be done by machines, would not serve the purpose. So we have to get back to the notion of employment. Uh, we do not employ computer, we employ human beings, people. Uh, but jobs can be created for even machines. So I thought that maybe this paradigm uh, needs, uh, needs to be, I mean, again, it's not, a, it's not exactly common. Maybe I have to learn from you what exactly has, what changes have been very important so as to uh, make it necessary to coin these kinds of terms. And uh, secondly, I have one small qu query about this uh, corporate social responsibility. We very often talk about corporate social responsibility. Could you, could, you, could you think of any way by which we could include this jobs creation matter under corporate social responsibility? Can it be accommodated in some way or other? Not, not exactly in a big way, but uh, some way. Uh, because we have been, uh, beca because the entire perspective is that as if uh, job and employment was uh, generated through, through demand uh, for people. Here it, it seems that corporate would be invited to give some jobs to people. So we have to make sure that the environment is very conducive so that entrepreneurs are uh, uh, very encouraged and invited to, but uh, again, from the history, historical perspective, we know that it was the entrepreneurs who wanted to set up uh, their enterprise and created jobs, and if necessary, they got people trained, uh, those kinds of things. So here, the sense is that uh, we have to make every possible means by which Entrepreneur would be pleased to come uh, to create a job instead of entrepreneur feeling induced to set up an industry where many people would be required for his own profit. Thank you. Thank you. There was one other hand that I had seen here. Was it? Hmm? Yes, please, please. Uh, would you mind if I sit down and talk? Please, Doesn't please, matter. just introduce yourself. <laughs> um, I'm K.R. Jinaya. I used to teach business economics in Delhi once upon a time. Uh, I entirely agree that there are instances when labor legislation was too stringent in India and it needed a change for employment creation. But I was wondering, whether self-regulation by the industry, as is being propounded now, is the solution. I say this because the size of factories, where factory inspectors have to inspect, has been reduced, has been increased. That is, there should be more employment. There should be more labor in those factories. But from the experience that we have of, you know, it is said that there will be a surprise check. And if a factory gives wrong report as a result of self-certification, it will be stringently punished. 
But I was wondering, we've had the football of pollution in Delhi for the past four years. We have had a legislation that there should be a pollution certificate for every vehicle in Delhi. And I know that 99.9% .9 of the vehicles in Delhi don't have such certificates. Have we also, will we also introduce an effective mechanism by which the surprise check of self-regulation will be brought about? I wish the Secretary, Ministry of Labor was yeah. here. Yes, thank you. Actually, she's been called uh, by Cabinet Secretary, so she had to leave. But uh, I'm going to turn to Manish and the others if they want to respond. Yeah. Sure, thank you. Um, I think you raise a very valid point. There is no such a thing as a theory of jobs in economics, and is one of the things we were confronted with. And typically, you, you go and you talk to people in government, and they will tell you, my first concern is jobs. And then you say, well, I have a theory of employment, not necessarily a theory of jobs. And when uh, I was asked to lead this report, this World Development Report, it was so central. There has been the global crisis, there was unemployment, everybody was talking about jobs, there was the Arab Spring, there was this clear realization that lack of jobs or, or or lack of fairness in access to jobs could trigger massive social unrest. So basically we're asking, can you have a second look at this? And our first, uh, the, the, the report has at the end of every chapter what we call one difficult question. So trying to use the framework to rethink um, issues like uh, job strategies or growth strategies or protecting workers or protecting jobs or uh, skills or jobs, which comes first. So each, each of the chapters, and I want to encourage you if you are interested, these are like four pages. They can be downloaded separately. Our first question is, what is a job? Because it was not so clear. We have very clear definitions of employment. Uh, and so what we tried to do was to really combine labor economics, the theory of employment, with other bodies of economic literature to try to make sense of thinking from a job's perspective. And when we did this, we came up with some interesting things, I believe. Like, for instance, we tend to think that employment is derived from growth. So we tend to think about growth. Uh, but we tend to miss in doing that, that there are some opportunities in which if you don't focus on jobs, you don't get the growth. And so in which part you put the policy action, for instance, if you think of issues of female labor force participation, if you think of issues of uh, employment for young men in areas where there is conflict, if you think about urbanization, which is making people internalize that by being in cities they make everybody else more productive, you can come up with conclusions in terms of policy that are slightly different. But I agree with you that um, I, I will not dare to call it a paradigm shift. We tried to get some of the brightest minds to work with us. We had, from a living standards perspective, we had Ravi Kambur from a firm dynamics perspective, John Halti Wonger from a social cohesion perspective. We had George Akerlof. We tried to really bring new perspectives into thinking. I'm not sure that, uh, that, we, that we succeeded. We tried corporate social responsibility. We went in depth in trying to understand when it works and when it doesn't. And we have a very good database for that, which is the Better Work Program that the World Bank runs together with the ILO, starting in Cambodia, now in eight countries. And that was a very le good learning ground, because what we realized is that Cambodia had to start on that, because they will not get to uh, exports to the US if they could not agree to some code of conduct by firms. And the capacity of the government at that time to enforce regulation was very weak. And what we learn is that many of these producers are of very low productivity. So if you just push them to say, do corporate social responsibility, they don't have the margin for that. Unemployment will suffer. What was interesting about the Better Work Program is that it also helped entrepreneurs to be more productive and then to transfer part of that gain to better conditions for the workers. So one has to work on both sides. Just mandating corporate social responsibility probably will not work. So I think the interesting question which you raise is, do entrepreneurs create jobs for themselves or, or I mean, do they owe something or does somebody owe them something? I mean, I, why do people become entrepreneurs? My parents were civil servants and it's hard to be an entrepreneur. I will submit we're making it harder. Um, India is a hostile habitat for entrepreneurship. We have to generate our own power. We have to provide our own transport. We have to provide our own security. We have to provide our own transport. And I thought you implied that we had to manufacture our own employees by training them. It's, it's kind of a high bar, my submission is, for small enterprises to expect them to substitute for the state. 
Um, entrepreneurs cannot substitute for the state. Many, all of us idiots in the private sector who were saying this grass grows at night while the government sleeps were, were, were idiots. <laughs> we, we need, uh, the, the first phase of reforms were the sins of commission, what the government was doing wrongs. We are struggling with the sins of omission, what the government is not doing. So I would say that there is, if you, from an entrepreneurial perspective, I, you know, one of the differences that India has so many dwarfs rather than babies is the regulatory cholesterol. <laughs> and the government doesn't owe it to anybody to fix the regulatory cholesterol, but if you want to get 400 million people or 300 million people off farms, you're going to have to make it easier to create jobs. Um, if you don't want to get them off farms and let them hang out there, then that's fine. So my submission is that from a policy perspective, there is now enough specific actionables to make India a more fertile habitat for jobs. If we get them done, is there a guarantee that jobs will be created? Maybe not. I, I do want to address your CSR point. Um, I, it, it really upsets me when people talk about social enterprises because anybody who creates jobs ethically and legally is a social enterprise. You know, we already have CSR, it's mandatory CSR, it's called taxation. And um, my submission is, again, you're raising the bar too high. It's very hard to be an entrepreneur. There are very few entrepreneurs who will create companies with more than 10,000.